Hello students. Today we're going to spend some time talking about assertive communication. It's a skill that you will find that will be invaluable as you move in your career as a social worker. So we want to talk about some things this morning. One, the whole concept that we cannot not communicate is something that I heard for the first time in my graduate program, in my MSW program, when a professor was talking to us about the ability to communicate and how vast and how continual that it is. He explained to us that utilizing all of our senses or parts of our senses at any given point in time, when we found ourselves in the proximity of other human beings, communication was taking place. It doesn't always have to be verbal, sometimes it was visual, but communication is a constant and something that we need to be aware of as a concept that it's something that we're always doing in the context of how we connect with other humans. Typically, in this process of communication, this tends to often be something that comes about for us in terms of understanding the information, or you think you know what I said, but what you don't know is what I said is not what I meant. It's about how we communicate those things, or sometimes how we miscommunicate when we're talking with other people. So if you think about the root of most conflicts, you'll find that it was often a miscommunication. So two things to keep in mind. <clears throat> communication is always something that occurs and miscommunication typically is at the root of why things don't work the way that they're supposed to. So let's talk about how we really communicate. Did you know that 60% over half of all the communication that you have with other human beings has nothing to do with what you're actually saying? 60% of all communication is nonverbal. It's about what it is your body is doing, what posture you have, the tone. That is a clear indicator of communication uh, and how it actually works. So again, keeping in mind that over half of what it is you try to have another human being to understand as you connect with them has nothing to do with what you say. This is an important lesson to keep in mind when you think about the work that you will be doing with clients and being, paying attention to your nonverbal communication. 30% of communication actually is about how we say what it is we say. We have a tendency to pay attention to inconsistency. So there has to be consistency in terms of the nonverbal communication as well as the verbal communication. Uh, and I'll give you an example about how we communicate and how we say what we say. So if I were to walk up to you and ask you for, uh, hi, excuse me, uh, I'm in need of a, an ink pen. Could I borrow a pen uh, from you? I'm being real clear about the communication. My nonverbal uh, communication style is one that's open, that's friendly, that's actually making a reasonable request. So if I were to approach a person and ask for a pen and did it this way, wow, I really need a pen. I'm, I, things are not working out. I, I just need something. Right. Hey, you. Yes, you. Can I? Can you let me borrow that pen? I'm in a hurry here. Can't you see that I need to move forward? Now, it's an over-dramatization, but if you think about the difference between how I asked for the pen the first time as opposed to how I asked for the pen the second time, you can see very clearly then that how you say it, what it is you say it makes a huge impact. And when you combine that with uh, the nonverbal communication, uh, the apparent agitation or the things that are happening for me in a physical way, then you can see that this is what people will understand and this is what folks will hear in terms of the communication. Interestingly enough, only 10% of what of communication is what we actually say. So if you start doing the math here, you can see that 60% of your communication being nonverbal and 30 being how you say what you say, that often the message can get lost in the very fact uh, that you've got all of these other contributing figures, contributing factors, I might say, uh, that help hinder communication. So again, keep this in mind. 60% of communication, nonverbal, what your body's doing. 30%, the attitude, how you project. And 10% is what you're actually trying to get people to understand about the dialogue. So 
these are some examples of nonverbal communication, so things that we are actually uh, doing in the process of communicating with others. So how your, your body posture, sitting down, standing up, being behind a desk, leaning into a conversation, leaning away from a conversation, having your arms folded. All of these are things that communicate to people what might be happening for you. Uh, eye contact, uh, too much, too little, uh, the need for space. Sitting, standing conveys control. How close are you to the person that you are talking to? Are you leaned in? Are you across the room? Are you at the other end of the hall? Or are you in their face? These are all nonverbal pieces that really communicate information as well. Touching. Do you touch a person when you're having a conversation? Do you put your hand on their shoulder? What kind of things are happening when you're doing the nonverbal? And then your facial expressions. Oftentimes, I think it's, it's a good idea for students to actually sometimes practice their scripts or practice their dialogues that they're going to say in a mirror because you'd be very interested to find out a lot of times um, how we're feeling, what we're actually thinking becomes pretty apparent in terms of our facial expressions and how we respond. So again, paying attention to uh, facial expressions, recognizing that these are all forms of nonverbal communication. So, then the how we say what we say. Uh, clear articulation of ideas. Uh, oftentimes, um, and I'll give you an example. Have you ever been in, let's say, a training with a very knowledgeable professional uh, who has done this work for a billion years? And they are so in tune and they are so knowledgeable about the work that when they start to teach or they attempt to share what they know with you, you find yourself having a hard time actually keeping up because they are using language or they're using jargon or they are coming from a place uh, with so much knowledge, but they have this inability to actually be able to break it down into digestible chunks of information for you to actually understand. So again, how you articulate those ideas. The use of positive and negative statements, and, and this is interesting, and oftentimes we don't pay attention to how we can utilize those statements. Uh, for example, uh, having a conversation with someone who's bringing to you a new idea about uh, trying to different to a different concept, and your response might be, well, you know what, we've tried that before and it didn't work. There is inherent negativity that's laced in those kind of statements. So oftentimes, I think oftentimes without thinking, uh, we need to pay attention to the verbal styles that we use as it relates to whether the information is negative and or positive. The use of reflection. Uh, are we reflecting on what it is we're actually saying? Does it make sense to us? Does it make sense to the folks that we're talking to? Concrete versus abstract. Thinking about the concept in social work practice around meeting people where they are is a very important concept. And you will have clients from all differing abilities. And for some clients, you can be more abstract in terms of presenting concepts, ideas, things that you're going to be working with them on. And for other clients, you know, you will have to be more concrete. You'll have to be more basic because the understanding levels, the age levels, or there may be actually other issues with them that prohibit them uh, from being able to process information uh, in the same way that you would with someone who is in a different place. So keeping those things in mind in terms of your verbal style. <clears throat> the use of value judgment. How we have to be very careful about in the conversation whether our own values are what's at play in terms of how we communicate with others. And then being in control, uh, being able to actually uh, drive the conversation and being able to actually hear and to listen um, and to sometimes be able to hear and have to deal with things that might be unsettling or upsetting, but still be able to manage to communicate in a way that, that shows some degree of control for you. It's going to be very important in your journey as a social worker. So when we think about how we typically respond to difficult situations or problems, 
and you're in a profession where your job will be to do these kind of things, dealing with difficult problems and situations on pretty much all the time. Uh, there are things that clients do and there are things that you will do as a practitioner. So a typical response to a problematic situation is really avoiding it, uh, not responding or saying what it is you think or feel. And there are times in many situations where this is a very appropriate strategy in terms of uh, dealing with situation or conflict. Uh, for example, if you are in line at McDonald's and you're in a hurry and you're at the end of the line and a person comes in uh, and decides to cut in front of the line, um, in front of you, meaning that you're going to be even later now, um, one way of, of, of dealing with that situation may be to avoid it. You know, it's, it's aggravating, but what's it worth for me in terms of having a full blown out confrontation with some strange person in McDonald's because I'm already late on my lunch hour. So I might avoid this. I may not say a whole lot. I might be agitated by it, um, but I might decide to avoid that kind of situation. I would probably be more inclined to avoid that situation, especially if I felt like this particular person was going to pose a, a threat to the safety of my well-being, like, you know, wanting to punch me out for confronting them uh, in terms of cutting front of the line at McDonald's. So it's things like that. So there are times where it's appropriate to avoid situations, and there are times where it's inappropriate. So if you find yourself always avoiding the conflict, then that can be problematic in and of itself. At the other end of the spectrum, we have the aggressive response. So in other words, and we all know folks in our lives that are those aggressive people who have to be able to push for their ideas regardless of how it affects others. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, there's probably some person that's in your family or that you've connected with over the course of your time here on the planet that when the phone rings for them to say, hey, let's go hang out and let's go eat dinner, uh, it might not be uh, very difficult for you to find yourself with other things to do that will keep you from being able to be at the dinner because typically what happens is when you go out with that person and you go to dinner with them, they find fault with the food, they're rude, they're aggressive, they're pushy as it relates to trying to resolve the issues and it makes for this unsettling environment. So um, aggressive folks sometimes actually damage relationships and don't resolve problems because they always have to have the last say. Does that mean that it's never appropriate to be aggressive? Absolutely, you need to be aggressive when there are situations that warrant it. For example, if you're a parent and you come into some information about your child who might be, let's say, using drugs and you become aware of that, then avoiding that situation means that it's only going to get worse. But you might want to aggressively actually pursue a conversation with your child to look at what kind of treatment options are there because you recognize that failure to, to act aggressively and quickly could result in your child actually doing considerable damage to themselves or finding themselves in trouble with the legal system. So again, it's about really looking at the context of the situation. So what we're wanting to spend some time talking today about is the whole notion of assertive communication. And so when we're talking about assertive communication, it's striking a wonderful balance between avoiding the situation and being aggressive. And assertive communication basically is communication skills that allow you to state your feelings and ideas without denying the rights of others to be treated fairly. So it's about really asserting oneself, and so we're going to spend some time walking through what that actually looks like. So we use this particular model called the DSC or the DES model, and this is what we want to actually do spend some time with today, actually making sure that you understand that as you are engaging with clients, when you're engaging with people in your family, when you're engaging with folks in work situations, or just in the general public, that there is a way, a systematic way, to ask people to change their behavior as it relates to how they connect with you. The first step is to actually describe the behavior. So what we're doing and when we're describing the behavior is we're sitting down and we're having a conversation with people about what it is you experience when you're experiencing how they interact with you. 
and we'll talk more about this and I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about shortly. The second thing after you have actually described the behavior uh, that you have experienced in terms of interacting with this other person is you want to now state the feelings or the effects that it has on you. So if it's a work situation you want to state how you feel about the behavior that you experience and the impact it's having on your work or on your school or in your personal relationships. So those are the things that you want to keep in mind in terms of walking through those particular steps. The next thing that you want to do in terms of this request for behavior change is to specifically state what it is you need to happen or what it is you need to be done differently in the future. Uh, this is very important uh, because you're walking through a process and it's a way to make sure that you're being treated fairly with dignity and respect but also being real specific in terms of what it is you need and what it is you want to actually move the process forward. The last thing that you do is you want to talk about consequences. Uh, you want to be able to talk to folks and let them know that if they are actually able to look at what it is you've requested or you specify that you need, what would be the positive outcome of them actually being able to share that or being able to engage in that type of behavior. Um, you also want to then balance that piece by explaining to folks the negative consequences. So if you're not able to give me these particular things that I need, then these are the likely, this is the likely outcome or this is how things will progress uh, based on that. So there is in your Blackboard shell, uh, there is a, a module, um, the DSC form that allows you to actually take some time and think about having a conversation with a person using this particular methodology. It gives you the ability to actually kind of create some notes for yourself and then to move forward with the dialogue. So let me give you an example of um, a situation that I actually had and I used the assertive communication strategy um, and it actually worked very, very well. Um, I had a situation at a former workplace where I had a new supervisor uh, who had been on the job for, I don't know, maybe about six months or so. But what I was starting to notice is that on the occasions that I would meet with them uh, or be called to their office, I typically found myself uh, in a situation where I was actually explaining um, circumstances and situations that other folks had had a conversation with my director about and so she took them validly at face value and I was questioned about those particular things um, and really fairly heavily directed in terms of all of the things that I need to do to do the work. So initially I thought well <clears throat> you know this is a new person and we don't really know each other that well and so um, we'll bear with it and as she realizes who I am and how I do my work uh, then we'll work through some of those difficult situations. Except for this continued to be the pattern of behavior for several more months. And so I found myself in a place where I was very frustrated um, um, and really needed to deal with this situation. So I remembered my own training uh, around assertive communication. And so I sat down and I wrote up uh, the modules around describing the behavior, expressing my feelings, and actually specifying what I needed to happen different and talking about the consequences. So <clears throat> I requested a meeting with my uh, supervisor. Um, I had printed out all the things that I wanted to say utilizing this particular model. I made a copy for that person as well. And I sat down and, and talked about it. I said, well, I need to have about five minutes of your time. And what I would like to do is to actually uh, share some things with you that I really want you to think about. You don't have to give me an answer today but I really do want uh, us to spend some time talking about this. So step one, I described the behavior. So I described to her um, the pattern that I had noticed that when I had been meeting with her for the last several months, that there always ended up with a situation where I had to explain uh, what had happened or some circumstances, and it was third party information as opposed to me. So I, I described to her, here's what it's like. On these particular days we met, we had a conversation about X, Y, and Z. And I found myself having to explain those things. 
and over the last six months I've had to do that now about five times. I then moved to the next step which was expressing. So how does this impact me? How does this impact the work? And so I was able to say to that particular person that, you know, for me this is very frustrating. This is very frustrating um, and it's causing me to feel undervalued, uh, not appreciated, and really actually not liking work. And so um, these are things that are actually impacting my ability to do what I need to do because I have to run everything by you. And then on the other hand, I have to then uh, explain situations which I'm not even aware about. And so it's frustrating for me and it's actually causing me to really dislike my job. The third thing that I asked about was specifying what I needed. What I need different from you is I need for you to talk to me and allow me to have the responsibility to do the job that I see fit. To take some time to get to know who it is I am and what it is I actually do. And I would also encourage you to have conversations with other people who I've worked with here in the agency over the long time that I've been here and you will actually see that you know some of the things that are being brought to you are probably not accurate. Um, I went to this fourth step, which talks about consequences. The positive consequences is if you can do this, I think that we will have a less strained and a better working relationship. The negative consequences is that I think if you're not able to move uh, in a direction to look at some of the things that I've asked for, I think we're going to continue to have difficulty in our working relationship. I said, so I want you to think about those things. You don't have to give me a response now at this particular point in time. Uh, but to keep in mind, these are the things that I'm going to need to actually be the most productive worker. Interestingly enough, uh, within uh, a few minutes of the conversation, uh, the supervisor was able to say to me, you know, I thank you for, first of all, sharing this information with me. I had no idea that you were feeling the way you did about your work situation. Um, and I really need to evaluate. And now that I think about what you have said to me, uh, you were right. I have allowed other people to talk to me about things that really weren't uh, uh, validating, actually. And so I have to also uh, admit to you that personally, in my own personal life right now, I'm having some struggles with uh, my spouse, who is uh, this African American male, and we're struggling. And so my trust level for men in general. Uh, is a little bit lower and so I'm a, I apologize to you that you got caught in some of that. So I share that story with you which is an actual true story to really share with you the power of being able to utilize uh, assertive communication in a way to actually speak up for yourself to make sure that uh, you are heard and that it does work. It might take you several times of actually having to have that conversation but it does work. So some things to remember uh, as we close. Um, avoid having this dialogue uh, when either party is highly emotional. So if you're upset or angry or sad about something that has taken place, now is not the time to deal with it because what tends to happen is the emotion is what people tend to remember and they never hear what it is you have to say. You can always talk at a later date. Don't argue. Arguing defeats the purpose. Your intent in an assertive communication conversation is basically to give people some information for them to think about. So resist the temptation to try to prove a point or to argue because you're basically sharing with people what you've experienced, how it's impacted you, what you need to happen different, and the consequences for those things. So keeping it simple. The next thing is practice, practice, practice because Typically, we don't find ourselves in situations where we have these conversations. They're often emotionally driven or driven by circumstance, and they're not often very well thought out. So think about all of those particular things uh, as you move forward. And so at this point, I'm going to conclude the video. Uh, be consistent and also recognize, and actually with that situation with the former supervisor, I actually had to have that conversation a couple of times before it actually kicked in and made a big difference. So it's something that you'll have to continue to work at. Um, what I'd like for you guys to do at this particular point is to, to, to kind of reflect on some of the things that I've shared with you. And then um, we'll actually do some role plays here now in class 
uh, that helps you walk through that particular process. Thanks and good luck.